Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our news conference as the annual meeting draws to a close. My name is Jonathan Charles. I'm the Director of Communications of the EBRD. And here with me is the President of the EBRD, Thomas Miro, the President-elect, Susuma Chakrabarti, the Secretary General, uh, Enzo Quattrociacci, and the Head of Media Relations, Anthony Williams. Uh, I'd like to start, I think, by uh, asking the Secretary General to perhaps say a few words about some of the decisions that were taken at this 2012 annual meeting. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we had a particularly uh, busy annual meeting in many respects. Let me remind you that uh, we have uh, a very well-attended business forum still going on as we speak, but especially it was busy in terms of institutional matters to be dealt with, and I shall mention two. Uh, first, uh, governors were asked to approve, and did approve, a net income allocation of 1 billion euro to the EBRD SEMED Investment Special Fund so as to enable the financing of investment operations in the southern and eastern Mediterranean. This will be possible as soon as the process of ratific ratification of the amendment to Article 18 of our Articles of Agreement is completed by our shareholders. And in this connection, I should like to mention that we also welcome two uh, new members of the bank, namely Tunisia and Jordan. At the same time, as you know, we had an election of the president of the bank with more than one candidate for the first time in the history of the bank. Um, our articles of agreement uh, say basically three things about uh, the president. The first one is that uh, we have to have a president. Uh, the second, that uh, the president is elected for a term of four years. And the third, that it, to be elected, he has to be supported by a vote of a majority of the total number of governors, representing not less than a majority of the total voting power of the members. So, uh, governors, uh, uh, we had to provide for uh, rules for election, and governors devoted the second session of the annual meeting to the election, which took place according to the rules recommended by the board of directors and approved by the board of governors. And the election was preceded by a session of informal interviews with all the candidates last uh, Thursday. Uh, finally, briefly, uh, the Board of Governors also elected uh, its chair for the period 2012-2013 until our next annual meeting, which will take place in Istanbul. And the governor for Bulgaria was elected chair of the Board of Governors, and the governors for Georgia and Turkey were elected vice chairs. And uh, finally, the Board of Governors also approved the resolution on the date and place of the annual meeting in 2014, which will take place in Warsaw in May. Enzo, thank you very much indeed. Uh, President Miro, perhaps I could ask you to say a few words. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Enzo. Well, uh, Enzo has just provided you with the information that the EBID should have a president, to some degree it has now even two, uh, with an outgoing one and an incoming one. Um, but to, on a slightly more serious note, I think um, it is indeed extremely important that there has been uh, no situation and no time space of uncertainty. Uh, this must not happen in times like these, in which financial markets, as you all know, are extremely volatile, in which rating agencies look at international financial institutions in the way uh, they do. So I think the stability and the robustness of the governance, which has been demonstrated by governors, is extremely important in terms of the efficiency and e effectiveness of EBRD. I have, um, of course, already conveyed to Sir Suma my heartfelt congratulations. I really wish him well, personally, but also with regard to the future of the bank. It's uh, no secret that because of the difficult times, also the EBRD will face very serious challenges, especially, of course, uh, with regard to the fact that EBRD will now very soon enter into new territories and start to 
invest into the southern and eastern Mediterranean and to kind of translate and at the same time adapt the experience we have drawn from our commitment to Central and Eastern Europe uh, to uh, this new region, a new region which now also is in transition. I think it's fair to say that um, all what we could provide to our shareholders, shareholders was clear in that uh, the EBRD is in a good shape that uh, we managed to retain a AAA rating with a stable outlook, which is probably not just self-understood in these times, that again this year we are on a good way to deliver on the nine billion of annual business volume we are bound to deliver. I think we are at 2.6 or something like this uh, as we speak. And therefore, I think um, even though it will be challenging, of course, um, Sosuma can take over the EBRD, first of all, on the ground of a strong support of its shareholders, and secondly, in a good and robust shape so far. Thank you very much. President, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll ask now the President-elect, Sasuma Chakrabarti, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I want to start by saying something about Thomas, actually. Um, I think it, we've been very, very lucky uh, in having Thomas Miro as President of the EBRD for the last four years. He's an outstanding professional firstly. Uh, what he has done here to deliver results in terms of the operational and financial efficiency, the AAA rating, the response to the financial crisis, and also the expansion now into the southern and eastern Mediterranean uh, shows great strategic vision as well as great professional integrity, and we were lucky to have him for these four years. The second thing I'd like to say about Thomas is about the man himself. Uh, he's uh, He's an unassuming individual, Thomas. He won't like me saying a lot of this because one of the things about Thomas is he doesn't actually thrust himself forward in the way some people do. And that's the nicest thing about him, actually. He cares deeply about the institution, about his staff, and he wants them to take the credit. And of course, it is a team effort, but this team wouldn't have done so well without Thomas as its leader. And we are very, very lucky to have had him at the helm of this institution for the last four years. He leaves a great legacy for me and the team to take forward. We will try and protect his legacy. It's really, really important, and we'll take, take, take it forward as well. The second thing is really about EBRD staff. I think um, this is an institution that I was involved in in its creation, uh, have been involved with over the years, uh, with a short sabbatical, I suppose, for the last four and a half years when I've been running the Ministry of Justice here. Uh, but I have enormous uh, pride in this organization, passion for its mission, but the staff, and the management here have done a cracking job over these 21 years. And it's a bit of a model institution internationally, in my view. I'm pleased that the competition took place uh, on fair and open terms. I think uh, it reflects very well on the institution and on the shareholders. Uh, I think each of the candidates offered very different things and very great candidates, actually, and great campaigns they ran too. And I'm glad the process was followed in the way it, ha it was. Uh, and I'm pleased in the end to have got very wide support from uh, a wide range of shareholders within the European Union, both the Eurozone and outside the Eurozone, and also uh, across the rest of the world as well. I think that's a good thing for the bank uh, to have had. It's an exciting point, uh, Thomas says. I mean, it's a really exciting challenge uh, that with the bank now faces huge challenges. I see the number one challenge is uh, maintaining the AAA rating, uh, maintaining sound banking principles as we go forward. The bank has done that so superbly over the last 21 years. We must maintain that. I see the other thing is very, very important, and it's important at all times, but particularly after a competition for a leadership, is the importance of the president and the team reaching out to all shareholders, actually, to make sure that we're all united to face up those challenges ahead. So that's what you'll have from me. Thank you very much. 
So, Suma, thank you very much indeed. Well, now, obviously, uh, if you'd like to ask questions, please come forward. If you could say which organization, which news organization you're from, uh, then that would be great. To start off with Hanno. Um, three questions. Ha ha yep. Uh, yep. Hanno I'm sorry. FAZ. Hanno Musla, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, three questions. First to um, President Miro. Um, how disappointed are you that you have to leave? And maybe I add the two, quest two more questions to uh, Sir Zumar. Um, which countries do you expect to ratify next the enlarged mandate to the Mediterranean? And how do you want to speed up the whole ratification process. And um, well, you said, third question, you said yesterday that this open election process strengthened, in your view, uh, the institution of the EBRD, but uh, did it not also harm? I mean, um, you, for example, criticized the Franco-German culture, which might be dominant in this institution. So how do you want to uh, go on in now you are elected. Thanks. If, if I may, I hope, Suma, you wouldn't regard it as being impolite, but the second question is not really to him, because we do hope that when he will take up the helm of the institution, we will be there in terms of ratification, at least in terms of the threshold we need to start operations. And then, of course, the full completion needs to be done. That will probably take another six months or so. And um, I think every president and every team at the bank will closely work with the international community to get all shareholders on, on this path. By the way, the very fact that some shareholders take longer than others has nearly no substantial reason. It's really because in some countries ratification processes are more complicated than in others and if we take the very simple construction of the European Union you will understand that ratification with the European Parliament is not the quickest one, is not as quick as it can be in Liechtenstein for instance. With regard to the first question, um, that is always something you know you look at with, with a bit of, of ambiguity. Yeah, I, have been, I have been privileged to lead this institution for four years. Uh, for me, it was very important to know and to see that the governance, the institutional support is secured by shareholders through the clear election of a president, this has happened, and um, this is important to me. I'm, I'm uh, also gratified by the fact that uh, many people tell me nice things these days, and as I have been in many public offices uh, already in my life, I tell you that this is always a bit of a risk if you take a public office and you can also easily go and um, have a situation in which people don't tell you so nice mm -hmm. things anymore. So I'm gratified by this and um, this is a very highly valuable experience in my life and what regards the substance, i.e. the look at financial markets, and the engagement for Central and Eastern Europe. These are themes of my life, and they will continue to be themes of my life till at the very end. So, in so far, I change uh, a function, a responsibility, but certainly not a commitment and a dedication. Thanks, Thomas. Shall I try the third question? Um, I think it would be pretty odd for a bank that believes in uh, competition to then not have competition because suddenly it thinks it's harmful for a particular purpose. I think this competition has been extremely useful because the five candidates had very different uh, experiences to bring uh, to, the, to the bank and for the challenges ahead. 
and so the governors could choose on that basis. So I think that's a good and healthy thing for the bank to have done, and it sets a bit of a benchmark for the international system, as various newspapers have reported um, today. Um, I think the issue about culture is an interesting one. I don't think it's about Franco-German culture or Anglo-Saxon culture or any other culture, actually. I, I, rather, I was rather interested in the Le Monde piece today uh, about Anglo-Saxon culture and so on. I mean, anyone looking at me, would they think I'm Anglo-Saxon? I mean, interesting idea. Um, uh, so, and if you look at my track record, you'll see a very diverse top team. I mean, you know, when I ran the International Development Department in DFID, who were my three deputies? a Pakistani, an Egyptian, and an Anglo-Saxon, uh, led by a Bengali Englishman. So I don't think um, that really stacks up, actually. I think, though, each, whoever's president, will bring some of their own experiences to how they run an organization, how they want to do that. Thomas has done that. Before him, Jean Lemire did that, and Jacques de la Rosière each brought something different. So some things will change, but I think you'll find a lot of continuity as well, because I'm very respectful of what Thomas has achieved. Uh, I don't think there's going to be some su sudden changes. Uh, I was asked in the interviews, actually, what would you change in the first 100 days? I said, um, well, you know, that's for American presidents. Actually, for a president of a bank, what we need to do in the first 100 days is listen, learn from all the colleagues around here. And that's what I plan to do. Thank you very much. Uh, Carol. uh Carolyn Cohn at Reuters. Uh, well, one question for Mr. Mirov and one question for Sir Suma. Um, Mr. Mirov, did um, the governors and shareholders today discuss um, the situation with the Eurozone and what can be done to mitigate the effects for emerging Europe? And um, for Sir Suma, uh, when you take the job on, are you going to look again at um, how the EBID deals with democracy or lack of democracy in some areas of its region of operation? Well, on your first question, indeed, um, of course, some shareholders again voiced the concerns they have with regard to fallouts and impact the Eurozone crisis has so far and may have, should it uh, get even worse than it already is. Uh, of course, there was not a debate about how to remedy uh, the problems of the Eurozone itself, but rather about what can be done to make the economies in Central and Eastern Europe more resilient and less dependent on these events and on further potential events. I think on the issue of democracy and so on, I mean, this is baked into Article 1 uh, of the uh, bank, and it's a really, really important part of why I applied, um, because, like Thomas, I believe in the open societies, open economies approach, which makes the bank distinctive. The bank is always looking at these issues. I know that, and there's a sort of review going on of where we might get to uh, on Article 1 in terms of its application. But that's work still in progress. So not having arrived yet, I think it'd be a bit premature for me to preempt that work. Uh, I, don't even, I haven't even seen the papers around it, so I need to obviously grapple with that when I get here. But it's clearly an issue that always needs refreshing in this sort of bank because of the special mandate that it has. Neil Buckley. Uh, Neil Buckley from the Financial Times. I'd like to um, put the same question to um, both presidents, um, outgoing and incoming. Um, George Osborne, the UK Chancellor, yesterday issued a kind of warning that if um, international aid to uh, the Arab Spring countries wasn't speeded up, then there was a danger that uh, democracy promotion efforts there could fail. Um, I'd like to ask the presidents, do you share those concerns? Do you think they're justified? And what will you be doing to uh, ensure that money does start flowing quickly and how quickly? Well, my answer is clearly yes, I do share this concern. Uh, it is very easy to grasp if you speak to people in the region that this kind of feeling of disappointment, sometimes even of deception, is, um, is widening. I think it has a bit to do with the fact that too many expectations have been created. I, 
have uh, said at, on some occasions already that I am very critical of this fashion of trying to pull together big numbers uh, in a bit of an artificial way. I think this time it was 40 billion euro, and thus creating expectations in terms of fresh money which simply you cannot deliver on. <laughs> at the same time, though, I would say that at least our shareholders, i.e. the Tunisians, the Moroccans, the Jordanians, and the Egyptians, have all conveyed to us that their criticism on lack of delivery does expressively not include EBRD. I think there is a feeling that indeed teams on the ground have started working, that EBRD is again meeting the expectation of being a hands-on institution. There was right from the outset an understanding that there need to be legal changes. We cannot just overlook it, but that we take any opportunity to cut corners uh, to the degree that it is legally possible uh, that is available, and that we have started with something like 40 technical cooperation projects and will in the course of the summer, uh, if I may say so, uh, start with uh, first concrete uh, investment activities, of course, subject to the approval of the board of directors. So. I think this is a general sentiment which has been rightly mirrored by uh, what the Chancellor has said. We need to speed up, um, but I don't think that he was very specifically hinting at EBRD, but rather at a broader environment and that indeed we try to counteract this kind of sentiment. I haven't got a lot to add to that because I agree with what Thomas says. I think um, during the campaign I visited the region and uh, what I heard was enormous praise actually for the way EBRD res had responded, a very, very rapid response, getting through its procedures actually very quickly and processes quickly to be in a position to get on with the task at hand. So I think rather the expectation is clearly high. I think George Osborne's concerns are shared actually by many other finance ministers that I met. Um, but actually, the EBRD is, if anything, uh, seen as being a bit of a benchmark for how you can engage very fast. Uh, and again, when I was in Washington, the IFC actually uh, made a, praised Thomas and his team for actually being more flexible, maybe, than some other institutions in how quickly it could respond as part of the Deauville partnership. So I think actually, EBRD is doing quite a good job on that. How quickly, though, do you expect them with the billion euros from the special fund to actually start flowing into the region? Well, as we said, excuse me, as we said, we will start with investments subject to approval of the board and, and through the board, the, the shareholders, in the course of summer. Whether this will mean first part of August or second part of August uh, or very early in September is probably premature to say, but um, this is what we, what we are aiming at. So as we are now in the second half of May, it's probably fair to say that in three months' time, we should be, we should be there. Um, maybe with critical London perspectives. Um, I was wondering if both presidents uh, think whether this new vote system uh, could lead to some significant changes in the way the uh, European and other international financial uh, institutions and organizations are managed and run, and in that sense whether it will lead to, to a, a new trend in international relations since uh, one of the actors of which is said to be run differently. To be frank, this is easier to comment on if one is not president. Um, my sense is that um, there is indeed a higher 
sensitivity to what could be perceived as backroom deals. Uh, whether uh, the commitment uh, to transparency, openness, and merit-based approaches uh, can be taken for granted in each and every respect, uh, maybe uh, looked at twice. I think um, even though uh, I am president-elect, I have a very similar view, actually, to this. I think it's likely to be a benchmark which other institutions will look at and ask themselves, and you as journalists and others will ask yourselves why something like this at least couldn't be approximated. And I think it's quite interesting. I don't think it's just the EBRD, actually, to be fair. I think even the World Bank and IMF contests, I mean, there has been some process of hearings and so on now, the World Bank contests very recently. So some of that is beginning to be understood amongst shareholders as, some, as a part of the process. And I do think the hearings here, uh, I obviously only heard my, I was only involved in my own hearing, but from what other people said, they were a very important part of the um, actual process because people were able to lay out, the, can, the candidates laid out their own different approaches to the job. And I think that's quite a good thing. Uh, so that, again, shareholders, the same shareholders and in other institutions, they're getting a bit more experience of that. Um, and I think the premium, um, well, the price of you know, not doing those sort of backroom deals that used to exist for the last 50 years, I think that's uh, risen because of all that. But it's not going to be some linear process, I think, uh, to, the, to change there. Um, hi, Amira. I'm a journalist from Egypt. Um, I'd like to ask you about, uh, indeed, these countries uh, that you're entering into are still in the, the middle of the transition process, and in Egypt, for example, has elections in the coming days. Are you all concerned about the, the legitimacy of the current uh, parliament or cabinet ministers and whether the, any incoming uh, new authority could actually come around and say, well, we're not very interested in having the EBRD uh, present after all, because that is one reason that the IMF has, in fact, delayed its um, assistance to Egypt is because they're not sure that the authority in place right now will still be legitimate and maybe in five to six months' time. Um, is that at all a concern of yours? And I'd also uh, like to ask, pose this argument that's been made that the EBRD is it's stretched too thin um, with the, the Eurozone crisis and its foray into the Semen regions. Um, how would you respond to that argument? Well, on the first question, my answer would be that you probably will never ever find the perfect solution because there is a demand for speed. And we discussed uh, 10 minutes ago uh, the growing sentiment of the international community having promised help and not delivering. So waiting until after a revolution a new constitution would have been worked out and agreed upon, elections having taken place, a first round of debates on whether one wants to work with international institutions and so on, and then starting to envisage to engage would mean that for years nothing would happen on substance. So I think you have to take a balanced view, knowing that indeed there is a lack of legitimacy at the start, but putting some trust that this will be remedied. And I took the occasion of the discussion this morning to say, with my experience, transition to democracy and multi-party systems and market economies is not a short trajectory. It's a long and winding and bumpy road with setbacks. And I have encouraged shareholders to continue to stay engaged and not to hesitate or to withdraw support because here and there 
things are not perfect. If I look at Central and Eastern Europe today, there are very many places in which things are still very far from being perfect. But would it have been better without EBRD engaging? My answer would be very clearly no. And in terms of our resources, if you take the human resources, we are hiring people and we are very glad to get on board very able and engaged and committed new bankers. And in terms of capital, we have calculated things very prudently and we are very confident that with the activities being built up after two, three, four years, so in Sir Zuma's second half of the term, the EBRD will be able to deliver something like two and a half billion in annual investments on top of the eight and a half billion which are committed to Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you. Uh, yes. <coughs> Raymond Lloyd, the editor of the Parity Democrat Westminster. I have three questions, but first, I would like to express my admiration uh, as someone who's been writing about the bank for 21 years at the way Thomas Miro has led the EBRD over the past four years. And as someone who has worked with the international community for 55 years since helping the International Red Cross resettle 200,000 Hungarians fleeing communism in 1956-57, how unusual it is for a an international body to be headed in succession by three presidents of the quality of Jacques de la Rosier, Jean Lemire, and Thomas Miro. Now, uh, question one in shortened form to Susuma. Yesterday, the, the independent newspaper had a photograph of the parity government of France, a government with an equal number of able women and men. France thus joins four other European countries with parity cabinets. There have also been two international bodies with parity directorates, the World Food Programme and UNESCO, both appointed by women heads. Some 12 EBDR operational countries have or have had women heads of state and government. EBRD has been given a good start by Thomas Miro, with five of 30 senior staff being women. May we expect, Susuma, that well before your four-year term ends in 2016, if not in the first 100 days, that you will be the first male head of a European body to appoint a parity directorate of able women and able men. Thank you, Raymond. Um, first of all, I really agree with your comment at the beginning about Thomas and his predecessors. I think we've been really well served by leadership here. I think on diversity, um, I made a theme of this in my vision uh, for the bank. And uh, you have to judge me on my track record and ask yourself if I'm likely to do the same here. I point out that both DFID and MOJ, the board of both is, i.e. the top two tiers of permanent secretary and the director generals, half female, half male. They weren't when I started. Uh, so I didn't inherit that position. And at MOJ now, Minister of Justice, 40% of the senior civil service is female. So something does happen when you believe in these sort of things, as Thomas has, and I'll take that work forward. But yes, I believe in diversity very, very strongly. I think there's a good business case, as well as a good ethical case. Uh, and it's shown in the sort of, uh, if you look at the staff survey results of those two organizations, the capability review results, you know, DFID still comes top of Whitehall uh, on all those parameters. And it's a lot to do with the leadership shown by the men and women there. But to do with diversity as well. If I could limit you to just one other of your questions, Raymond, sorry, just, uh, just for time reasons. So, yeah. okay. In recent years, the EBRD do excellent book, uh, publications on the hopes and fears of young persons born into a non-communist world. At the other end of life, there are still 80 and 90-year-old survivors from the Kazakh famine of 1930 the Ukrainian genocidal famine of 32, and the great purge of Russian dissidents peaking in 1937. Could the EBRD collect and tape an anthology of some of their reminiscences as a, as a warning even to our democratic age 
that we must always be on our guard against such future atrocities. Uh, well, perhaps as Director of Communications, I might ask, answer that one, Raymond. Um, we generally don't do historical documents. Uh, you know, we try very hard to do things that are currently happening uh, for our region, but uh, I note your question. Thank you. If, if I may add one, one comment to this. I think it is very important that you remind us of these facts. Uh, there is now this uh, history book about the killing fields in Central and Eastern Europe, and I think it is indeed necessary to recall what kind of atrocities have happened in this very region which the EBRD is dedicated to because it reminds us all of our responsibilities. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, Ben Perry from AFP News Agency. Um, a question for each of Suma and Thomas, if I may. Uh, Suma, why do you believe that you won the election? And what are your objectives over the next four years, aside from maintaining the bank's AAA rating? And a question for Thomas. Uh, Thomas, why do you believe that you lost the re-election, uh, despite it being widely acknowledged that you've done a fantastic job over the last four years? <laughs> well, um, because I like to think I run a really good campaign, um, because, you know, I put forward certain challenges, um, and this links to the second part of your question, uh, and uh, I thought that I had the experience to fit against those challenges, which I saw as essentially the expansion uh, to the southern, Medi southern Mediterranean. Uh, my background, frankly, in dealing with many economies and societies like those that uh, the bank is moving into, I think that's something I had. Um, secondly, let's take the sort of innovation and value-added area, uh, where my management experience, 10 and a half years, essentially running two huge organizations, was part of my pitch. And thirdly, I guess, the results focus, which Thomas has also been working on and the bank has been working on. Um, I pitch very strongly in terms of the need for creating a narrative, if you like, uh, aggregating all the great work that EBRD does on the ground and being able to show how it really is transforming societies and economies, which I think is really quite important anyway for an organization and it's for its self-confidence, but also to show shareholders that we can make a really big macro difference as well as a micro difference. So those are the things, themes I put forward. Those are the objectives, apart from the AAA credit rating. And they garnered support, as I said earlier, across quite an interesting range of shareholders. Uh, and there were no groupings. That was one of the nicest things about this election. Um, there was no sort of, you know, that was broken down for all, share in fact, for all the uh, candidates. So that was very helpful. Well, from a historian's perspective, I would say it's probably uh, there was a slight lack of enthusiasm from my own government. <coughs> <laughs> President, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's, uh, let's go there first, yes. I noticed in several of the meetings and in this meeting that when the four countries in the MENA region were mentioned, Egypt came forth. And I understand that Egypt was the first to apply to be included in the area of operation. Does this mean that the file of Egypt has been put back to the fourth? Uh, not at all. Um, I think it's just fair to say that uh, the political development in Egypt, uh, in formal terms also what regards the necessary agreements we have to have with authorities, make it slightly more difficult than uh, either in those countries which haven't experienced any revolution or who were ahead of Egypt in terms of revolutionary developments and then the setting of uh, new administrations and new political authorities. I think everyone here uh, at this time, this uh, part of the table and colleagues sitting here around is very, very aware of the fact 
that not only Egypt is a founding member of the bank, but that probably the fate of the region to a high degree will depend on whether the revolutionary development of Egypt will lead to something good and stable and something which the people recognize as being a growing success story. If this would fail, that would certainly radiate far beyond the borders of Egypt. So don't worry, nobody here will ever underestimate the importance of Egypt in this context. Yes. Hello, uh, Felix Lill, Die Presse from Austria. I have a question for the president-elect. Um, yesterday, the Tunisian central bank governor said liberalization and privatization would, um, as they were the policies in post, uh, post, post-Soviet times, um, would not be suitable uh, for, the new, uh, for the new members of the EBRD. So what could be the new stance of, of policy to deal with these countries? Thank you. I can only really give a general answer because I don't know um, Tunisia well enough really to give a considered answer and I think the question re- needs that. I think first of all you really need to tailor um, the approach country by country and that's one of the great things about EBRD. It's had this client focused country focused approach and that's one of the reasons I applied actually because I think it doesn't have a top down view of how to do things. So where liberalization uh, and privatization and the pace at which you do those and the sequencing at which you do those may be appropriate in some places, it may not be appropriate in others, and you have to take that into account. I don't have a set view that is always the right thing to do. Um, I'll give you some examples from uh, my past. I mean, for example, water is a classic example where different countries take quite different approaches. Or well, my current job, um, the uh, justice sector, in Britain, we're privatizing prisons. We're privatizing the probation service to a large extent. I mean, putting a lot of things in the private sector. That isn't the approach in many parts of Europe. So culture, different approaches to doing these things matter a lot. And EBRD has to be alive to that in every situation. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, my name is Messeze. I'm here for African Press Agency. Um, throughout my attendance in this workshop and uh, this press conference, I understand that your bank's uh, operations haven't gone beyond uh, North Africa. We've already have uh, in Africa, African Development Bank. I don't know how close you are or how far you are with it to understand the level of the needs on the ground in order to avoid the duplication of interventions? Well, indeed, the the relationship uh, with the African Development Bank is very close, Um, and not just on the top level. I met myself, uh, President Kabaruka, our homologue at the African Development Bank um, three or four weeks ago in Tunisia, but also on staff level. And I think it's very important to understand that the African Development Bank was very strongly welcoming the new engagement of the EBRD in an approach to say, we are very experienced on the ground, we would want to help you, but we have shortages of capital resources, and we also have some way to go in order to put greater emphasis on the private sector. And in this, we do look at EBRD as being a very helpful partner. And I think this is a very solid fundament SUMA can build on in order to indeed in practice build up this partnership of being rooted in the region, of knowing the region very well, and from our side, if I may say so, bringing in the private sector expertise. I'll just add one sentence to that because I also went to Tunis as part of the campaign and talked to Donald Kabaruka about it. And he said he really welcomed the BRD coming into this uh, area because the African Bank has many strengths, but one of the areas that clearly doesn't pursue is the private sector development. 
side, and EBRD has such a great track record, he wanted its skills, its expertise in the region as fast as possible. So it was already obvious, I think, that um, they're op with, op you know, welcoming EBRD with open arms, really. Uh, and I think that's a really good start. Are there any further questions? Okay, thank you very much for attending this press conference. Thank you very much.